Okay, so we talked about the actin myofilament a little bit last time, but I want to just pick up with that. So this is called the thin myofilament. So there's two myofilaments that make up a myofibril. There's actin and myosin, and they interact to cause muscle contraction. So what actually is contracting in that muscle cell are the myofibrils that make up the muscle cell. So that's, these are the contracting pieces, and it's the interaction of myosin and actin within the myofibril that causes the myofibril to shorten. So actin, the thin filament, actin, T-I-N, thin. Think of it that way. And there's a couple components that you need to know about it. First of all, we talked about the little subunits, the little blue subunits you see on this slide. Those are called G-actin, the individual like it's a pearl necklace almost. It doesn't look like two strands of a pearl necklace twisted together. So each pearl would be the G-actin. And then if we have a string of those G-actins, seven of those, <coughs> we call F-actin. I'm sorry, no, the two strands. A string of those are called F-actin. So we see two strands of F-actin made up of individual units called G-actin. So F-actin is just a string of G-actin. So we see those are shown in blue there. <clears throat> On the G-actin are these binding sites for myosin. So you'll see it says active sites for myosin attachment. We find that on every one of these G-actin molecules. But those G-actin, those binding sites for myosin are covered in resting muscle by tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is that rope-like brown structure over the surface that covers the binding sites for myosin on the G-actin when our muscles are relaxed. So that's important. We need that to switch between muscle contraction and mu muscle relaxation. Then there's another protein that controls the shape of tropomyosin, and that's troponin. Troponin is shown in yellow on this slide. So troponin has a binding site for calcium. So when calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum of the muscle cell inside the muscle cell, it binds to troponin, and troponin changes the shape of tropomyosin so that it exposes those binding sites for, my, for um, myosin on the G-actin molecules. So troponin controls muscle contraction, wouldn't you say? But what controls troponin? The binding of calcium. So calcium has to bind to troponin in order for it to change the shape of tropomyosin and expose those G-actin binding sites for myosin. So it's a lot of terminology, and um, I recommend that you <coughs> label. I gave you a special diagram as a separate document in Blackboard. I recommend printing that off so you can really see these things up close. Question? Can you use the G-actin and the F-actin? Just like one more time, because like there it says two strands of F-actin, but it says all strands of G-actin is F-actin. Correct. So Each individual little piece, so this is G-actin, this whole strand here is F-actin. Okay. Here's another strand of F-actin. So F-actin is 200 beads. Yeah, I think I get what you were saying on the bottom. It says <coughs> actin, two strands called, oh, okay, no, I think we're using that. Yeah, the necklace we would call F-actin. The pearls in the necklace we would call G-actin. Does that make sense? Okay, good thing we all know what pearl necklaces are. We never wear them anymore. They're kind of a grandma jewelry, but are they like everything, right? If you live long enough, everything comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, about that. Okay, does that make sense now? Oh, pearl earrings are pretty. All right, now we'll look at the thick myofilament. Myosin is the thick myofilament, and it has these little club-like heads on it. So they kind of look like little golf clubs, and this part can bend. It's called the hinge region. So this can bind to act, it can bend forward, bind to actin, and then bend backward and pull that actin toward the center of the myofibril. And we'll watch an animation of this. So the key thing is what are the binding sites on myosin? On the myosin head, there's two binding sites. There's one for actin. So myosin can go up and attach to actin to a specific, you know, to a single G actin. And there's a, my, there's a binding site for ATP because something has to energize the myosin head to do this movement of actin. So there's an ATP binding site and there's an actin binding site. 
so the best way to really get this all together is to look at an animation. So I'm going to go grab an animation for us to watch so you can see that. Okay, so here is a portion of a myofibril. So this is a portion of a myofibril. So this is the tiny little strand-like structures within a muscle cell. So there's a lot of these in one muscle cell. So what we have here is, what are these? You tell me. What are these pearl-like strands? <coughs> right, they're the actin myofilament. We'll just be kind of generic. This is the actin myofilament. And can you see the real thin-like rope structure? And though that is what protein? Tropomyosin. And then the green is, see the heads? This is the myosin, the thick filament. So if we look at this, we can see there's one myosin myofilament here, and there's half of an actin myofilament because there's this part of the actin, and then there's this part that connects the actin to the myofibril, which is called the uh, Z disc. See how it kind of goes like that, that arrangement? We call that a Z disc. So the other half of the actin myofilament is on this side. So we're only seeing half of a complete actin myofilament. But we can see there's an overlapping region. Would you agree with actin and myosin? They overlap at a point. And then there's a space here between one actin myofilament and another. This space here is called the H zone. The H zone. And then um, here's another Z disc. So the distance from one Z disc to the next Z disc, we call that a sarcomere. So a sarcomere is a, is a structure, but it's actually pieces of other structures, wouldn't you say? A sarcomere contains half of an actin myofilament. The other half is over here. It contains a whole myosin myofilament. Would you agree with that? And it has kind of an open, more open space in the center where we just see myosin. That's the H zone. But the border of a sarcomere is from one Z disc to the next Z disc. And the sarcomere is the structural and functional unit of the muscle cell. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So let's zero in and look at these structures. Traction of a muscle. Calcium ions bind to troponin. So there we this have something going on. That's calcium. If I back that up just a hair, that came from the sarcoplasmic reticulum of bind my muscle to cell. troponin. So it's going to bond to that orange structure. What is the orange structure? Troponin. Troponin binds calcium. This and moves tropomyosin out of the way and uncovers binding sites for myosin. And do you see how those binding sites are exposed now? So what's going to bind to these? The myosin head. Myosin so on the actin myofilaments. Those binding ADP sites are and phosphate are attached to the myosin head from the previous cycle of ADP movement. The myosin heads myosin attach to the exposed binding sites on the actin myofilaments to form cross bridges and the phosphate actin. is released. Energy stored in the head of the myosin myofilament is used the to move the head. This causes the actin myofilament to slide past the myosin myofilament. The ADP is released so from the myosin head here. as it moves. The bond between actin the and the actin myosin head is broken ATP when an ATP molecule binds to, myosin. Binds to the myosin cause? head. What did you see happen? Yeah, so to detach and stop that movement toward the center requires another ATP. But as long the as the ATP we have is broken ATP down to ADP and, and phosphate, releasing energy, which is stored in the myosin head, head and will be used later ATP for movement. Quickly. The head of the myosin molecule and returns to its upright position so and is ready to bind to actin again. If calcium ions are still the binding, and this process repeats, as long as we have two things available, what are they? calcium and ATP. So ATP causes detachment, splitting of ATP on the myosin head, cocks the head backwards to get it ready to pull more actin, and then it binds to the G-actin molecule again, and it continues to pull that toward the center. So the splitting of ATP occurs on the myosin head. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. So if we look at our PowerPoint slide here, 
The action potential, remember, at the neuromuscular junction is where that action potential formed from that motor neuron, right? So that was formed at the sarcolemma. We looked at this last time in our last video. It travels down the T-tubules, causes release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That calcium is here. It binds to troponin. As it binds to troponin, the tropomyosin is moved out of the way. It exposes the heads. And then myosin binds to actin and does a power stroke, pulling that actin toward the center. And then AT, a new ATP binds to myosin. The actin is released, and it starts that cycle over again. So it's a series of steps. So if I look at a myofibril, can you see the sarcomere is from one Z disc to the next Z disc? And that H zone is that region where we just find myosin, and the actin is in blue here. Can you see that that is not touching in the H zone? The H zone does not include the actin. Everybody agree with that? So I have this bolded and underlined. I think that's an important term that might appear on a test. Yeah, definitely. Question? We'll talk about that. Okay. We'll talk about that. Okay, so let's zero in on what a muscle looks like. This is from your textbook. And there's a little worksheet that I had you print off. I said we would do it together in class. So I'm going to go to that right now and look at that. Okay, so let's look at this worksheet. This is a muscle that is relaxed. So this first diagram here is a relaxed muscle. You can see the different parts, so we can go ahead and label. It says label the following areas. So the H zone is the region, like we said, where there is no actin, right? It's right in the center. So this arrow here in the middle is the H zone. So go ahead and label that. And we have a new edition of our textbook, so this diagram is actually shown on page 288 now. So page 288 is the correct page reference for this edition, and that's the 10th edition. Okay, so that's the H zone, this region in the middle where we only see myosin, and then the I band is called the light band. So it's the region where it appears light in a tissue slide. Can you see how it's lighter here? So this is the I band. So on, here's the Z disc. On either side of that is the I band. So this arrow here is I band. And this arrow here on this side is I band. And the Z disc are the little field goal symbols there, right? If you're a Lions fan, you were hooting and hollering on Sunday about that field goal. Anybody watch the game? Vikings? <laughs> if you're a Vikings fan, it was not very encouraging. But this is a Z disc. So that's what tethers this actin my or this actin myofilament to the myofibril so it doesn't slide around. Okay? So that's what the Z disc is. So that's there and there. All right, so let's answer some questions. The A band, the A band was this center or this region from here to here. So it's the dark region. This is the A band, all of this. So it's the same thing as the sarcomere, isn't it? Almost, you know, or not quite, I'm sorry. That's Z disc to Z disc, but most of the sarcomere is made of A band, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is the A band. It's dark. The word dark has the letter A in it, right? So it's easy to remember that. And I is in the word light for the light band, the I band. So this is the I band here. Here's another I band. And here's the A band, the dark band. So if you have that labeled, so that's what this is here. This is the, the A band, this arrow here. This we said was the H zone. These two were the Z disks. And this was the I band. I band. Correct? Everybody with me? Okay, so let's put, just put a check mark. What structures form the A band? So we're focusing on this here. The entire syn myosin myofilament? Yep. 
This is the entire myosin myofilament. So this is in the A band we're talking about. This band right here, so the answer, check that one, yes. Entire actin myomyosin, ugh. The entire actin myofilament? Correct. It is not. You are correct that it is not. <laughs> Do not check it. Okay. The overlapping regions of actin and myosin. Yes, that is in there. Only a portion of myosin that does not overlap with actin. Is this in there? Yeah, that's in there. Right, we're not saying only. We're saying what structures form it. So that is a piece of it. So that you would check that. A portion of myosin. Half of each actin myofilament that does not overlap with myosin. So here's the part that does not overlap with. Is that in the A band? Is that in the dark band? <laughs> if I follow that up, is that dark? No. So we do not check half of each actin myofilament that does not overlap. This is the part that does not overlap with myosin. Would you agree? That is not in the A band. We're focusing in this part of the myofilament where it's dark. So we're looking at this region here. All right, the protein that anchors the actin myofilaments to the myofibril. What do we call those? The Z disc. Is the Z disc here in the A band? No. No. So we only checked the first one, the third one, the fourth one, and that's it. Actin. Mm hmm. Yep, yep. So what structures form the I band? So we're focusing on this part now, the light. Light is I band. So entire, entire myosin <laughs> myofilament? No. Entire actin myofilament? Entire? No, not the entire one because it's part of it in the, in the A band, right? The overlapping regions of actin and myosin? Nope. Only a portion of myosin that does not interact with or overlap with actin? No. Nope. Half of each actin myofilament that does not overlap with myosin? Yes. So you check this one. The protein that anchors the actin myofilaments to the myofibril? Yes, the disease disc is part of the, a, of the I band. I band. <laughs> that is a special structure that holds myosin, and it's a spring-like structure, which means when, when um, we stretch our muscle, it has that elasticity. That's called titan, this protein here. We'll talk about it. All right, what structures form the H zone? So the H zone, remember, is the space between the actin myofilaments. So is the entire myosin myofilament in this H zone? No. No. The entire actin myofilament? The overlapping regions of actin and myosin? Nope. Only a portion of myosin that does not overlap with actin? Correct. Half of each actin myofilament that does not overlap? The protein that anchors actin to the myofibril? No. So just this part. So what structure contains myomycin, a protein that holds adjacent myofilaments together? That's what this dark green, or dark green, oh my gosh, dark orange line is. This is myomycin. See how it's attached to the myosin? So what structure contains that? The H zone. And what we call this little dark spot, a kind of light spot actually, can you see how it's showing up here? On our tissue slide, it's called the M line. The M line, think of myomycin, Myosin, called the M line. So you can say the H zone, but then also put M line. That's the name of it specifically. What protein helps the muscle cell spring back to shape after contraction? Janan, <laughs> what is it? Titan, correct. T I T I N. And circle that on the diagram. So let's just circle it over here so we don't interfere with it's the yellow little spring like structures. What specific structure makes up the large, <laughs> wide striations we see in skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue? 
large, wide striations. These are the large, wide striations, which is myosin and half of an actin, yeah, half of adjacent actins. Um, what specific structures? So we're saying uh, myosin and actin, overlapping regions. Which zone or band disappeared when the muscle is fully contracted? So here's my contracting muscle. So as myosin binds to actin and pulls that toward the center, the actins work this way, this way, this way, until they touch. What disappears? Yeah, the H zone. Which zone or band does not change in length? So just look at your bands here. Yeah, the myosin doesn't change in length, does it? Does the I band change in length? Yeah, this is much skinnier than the one that when it first started, right? Okay, which zone does not, okay, we just did that one. What is the structure and functional unit of muscle which actively shortens? The sarcomere, correct. So all the information from that worksheet is described here under this slide. And then I want to just quick um, look at this process of cross bridge cycling. A cross bridge is just a myosin head bound to a G actin. That relationship we call a cross bridge. A cross bridge. So we can just see that calcium has to bind, ATP has to bind, ATP has to split. And a new ATP has to bind in order for that myosin to detach from actin and allow for muscle relaxation. So for muscles to relax, calcium has to move back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by active transport. So it, it takes energy, it takes ATP to move calcium against the concentration gradient from being out in the cytoplasm to get it back into the SR. So that requires energy. So what releases the calcium then? If we want to keep calcium going, go back to the neuromuscular junction. What released it from the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Okay, even after that, if we assume that was there. What stimulated the sarcoplasmic reticulum to open up and release into the cytoplasm? Yeah, an action potential. So as long as we have nervous stimulation to this muscle, it's going to keep dumping calcium into the cytoplasm to bind to troponin and keep this muscle contraction going. Again, as long as we have calcium available and ATP available and a neuron with an action potential to get the calcium dumped out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then we have continued muscle contraction. Once we stop, once you set your book down, once you sit in your chair, you stop that stimulation of that muscle, then the calcium is actively transported back and that muscle relaxes. So ATP has to, here's a key thing, ATP has to bind to myosin in order to release that actin. So we need a steady supply of ATP. So if we look at something known as, I think this is a future slide, but I'll just talk about it here now, rigor mortis, when a person dies, there's no ATP production, right? Metabolism stops, oxygen stops, there's no, ATP is used up very quickly, and the muscles stay contracted. So what happens is the cells start to break down. There's a flood of calcium. It binds all of the actin molecules, causes muscle contraction, but there's no ATP to allow them to relax. So for just a short period of time, I think it's up to an hour or two after death. Is that what it says on my notes? Thank you for checking. That's why I wrote these notes, so I didn't have to forget these numbers. Three to four. Is that what it says? Okay, page 332. Again, three to four hours after death, and you can sleep for about 12 hours. 
Oh, 12 hours. OK, so quite a while. All right, so um, that stiffness, you know, when they talk about the body being stiff, it go goes away after 12 hours. And there was, um, there have been people that have committed murders that on the witness stand would say, oh, yeah, I came and after, you know, three days of not hearing from my mother, I came to check on her, and, and I touched her, and she was cold and stiff. And they would say, hmm, that's interesting. Three days later, huh? So she violated all the laws of physiology and had rigor mortis 36 hours after death. Impossible. So right away, because that person didn't know their anatomy and physiology, that put a major hole in their story, in their alibi, right? <laughs> so um, that's... So that's how the muscles relax. We need ATP to release those actin and myosin relationship. So let's talk a little bit about how muscles contract and get stronger. So how do we get a muscle to lift a, a, a hundred pound weight versus a pencil off the desk? Big difference there. Same muscles, but a lot difference in, in force of contraction. So if we look at a muscle cell, if we zero in on this picture here, a muscle cell is bundled into fascicles. We've already talked about that. So if I look at a motor neuron, a motor neuron will um, exit via the ventral root, right? So we have this motor neuron coming out, and it innervates a muscle cell. So a motor neuron and all the different muscle cells that it um, innervates or supplies with an action potential is called a motor unit. So a motor unit is one motor neuron and all the different muscle cells that it, it stimulates. So let's look at this red one here, motor unit two. We can see that here's one motor neuron, but look at the branches. The axon terminals will serve more than one muscle cell. So it's just like a tug of war. If I had the class engaged in a tug of war, and I put more students on one side of the rope compared to the other side, who's going to win? The one with more persons pulling, right? So with a motor unit, I'm going to get stronger muscle contraction the more muscle cells that are in that motor unit. Okay? So the larger the number, the larger the motor unit, the stronger the force of contraction. So our muscles, like your biceps, are made up of a series of motor units. Our quadricep muscles in the front of the thigh are made up of huge motor units, lots of muscle cells. So there's a lot of force there. But in your fingertips, is there a lot of strength in your fingertips? If I want to pick up a 100-pound weight, it's a little more difficult with my fingertips, isn't it? So there's less muscle cells in those motor units. Those are smaller motor units. But the benefit of smaller motor units is we get fine, delicate contraction and control. Like if you had to draw, write your name, if I put a marker on the end of your toe and said draw your name for me using just your leg, your straightened leg, drawing it on a wall, it might be pretty difficult to be really exact and, and nice looking in your writing. But with fingertips, fewer motor units are finer, more controlled, precise movements. Our eyelids, what do you think about motor units in the muscles of your eyelids? Very few, right? So. Motor units determine the strength. The more motor units we have contracting, the stronger the contraction. So strong, less precise movements, 1,500 to 2,000 fibers per unit. A dozen per motor unit for those delicate um, movements. So the strength of contraction is due to the number of motor units stimulated and how frequently I send an action potential down that motor neuron. We talked about that before, right? The frequency of action <laughs> potentials determines the strength of a stimulus. Bright light, many action potentials back to back. Loud sounds, many action potentials back to back. Strong muscle contraction, many action potentials. Because what happens is when I lift up a book off of a desk, I'm going to stimulate some motor units, but some are, are turning on while others are turning off. So I don't get fatigued as easily because I'm switching among motor units to keep that contraction. But the heavier the object, more motor units are recruited, right? 
So if I have more motor units recruited, there's less available to rest and keep that object up in the air, right? So we see fatigue happen with heavier objects because more motor units are recruited to that activity and there's less that are resting. If I pick up a pencil, I have a few motor units that are recruited to pick up a pencil and the others are resting. And as the ones that are working get tired, they turn off and other motor units turn on to keep my pencil going. So we don't see fatigue with light activities just because the motor units are switching on and off. So what does that mean then when we see all the motor units in a muscle contracting? I'm going to show you a video. But his body has so already has shifted into overdrive. Sliding down the rock or sliding Any down chance the Sinjin rock. has of survival depends on what's locked in the muscles of his arms, chest, and shoulders. But how can his muscles move something so massive? Muscle tissue works by contracting, pulling on the bone, using it like a lever. For a brief period, he was able to push that These contractions take place at a microscopic level. Each of Sinjin's muscles is made up of thousands of individual fibers, We've seen this bundled together like the wires of cables. Might be trapped under a Though they may get bigger or smaller through life, we're born with every muscle fiber we'll ever have. Within each fiber are yet smaller filaments. To activate the muscle, chemical triggers cause filaments next to each other to ratchet together, intermeshing like locking fingers. As they slide past each other, the whole muscle fiber gets shorter. These contractions are responsible for all our muscle movement. Even when exerting ourselves, most of us only use about a third of the fibers in our muscles at any one time. But if Sinjin's to live, with the cliff edge fast approaching, he will have to heave a rock weighing more than half a ton. Down the nearest bud okay, stream so like white water rafting, while looking down at yourself and shouting, I'm magnificent. This is 101 facts about the, the human the body. Number one. The, motor units. the average human being is made up of around, the oh boy, okay, uh, this of amount of atoms. The the Number two. So if I look Some at of these atoms that make up your bod are the same atoms together, that were part of the Big Bang. Of one Think of and that, you came from a Big Bang. Picture here, oh God, no, 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 I don't mean that. I mean the scientific one, the scientific Big Bang. I have just a, Number a three. Stimulus, Humans are mostly made up of fungi and bacteria, accounting for 90% of the cells that make up a human. Well, <laughs> I am 100% a fun guy. Oh, please, I'm sorry, don't leave, don't leave. Number four. Speaking of bacteria, 67 different species of bacteria pulled the average belly button their crib. Number five. Have you ever thought that your muscles look like a little mouse? Well, you may not be completely delusional. The word muscle comes from ancient Rome. The Romans thought that the bicep muscle looks like a little mouse, for which the Latin word is musculus. Though if your muscles do have a tail coming out of them, there really is something wrong with you. Number six. So that's Speaking it. of those crazy Roman Sorry? guys, their top tip for having clean and sparkling teeth is to use urine while brushing them to yes. get a nice white shine. I mean, people will never talk to you again, but at least you'll have a dazzling toothy if I sheen. It more, I'm not gonna Number get seven, more the strongest in muscle, muscle in the human body is the masseter recruited. located in the jaw, which helps you bite. Day, right? It can cause your teeth we to exert 200 pounds. So now you can claim that you do lift Superman after all. Typing. But it's mainly your masseter when you're dining down on a particularly chewy bag of marshmallows. Number eight. New so cells regenerate at 25 look, million new cells per second. Wow, that's quicker that than a time lord in an abattoir. So that's gonna get Number more nine. More the human bod is about 18% carbon, with which, if you ever need to really quickly write something down, you can make 9,000 lead pencils. And this is what Number we have ten. Over, right? we can't yes, the that Valentine's Day cells, card that you got from the mid-2000s was right. You are a diamond shining cell. bright. That's how we get big or you muscles. can be. All you need is 60,000 times the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere to become one. Maybe a bit difficult to find. Number 11. The human body contains a cupful, or around 250 so grams, I, you know, of salt in it, which is why your sweat and tears taste a bit salty. I mean, in general, not that I've tasted yours specifically that much. 
if I wanted anymore. to lift a book or a really heavy item Number off 12. the table. The human body is made up of 0.2 milligrams of gold. No, we go a bit but before you go and think you're loaded for life, you would need the blood of 40,000 people mice before you'd have enough gold to make an 8 gram coin, which would be worth around $289. So, not worth the murder, really, is it? Number 13. You can make 7 bars of soap or 75 candles out of the fat found in the average human body. That's Valentine's Day sorted. Number 14. So you can Each day, humans your, lose you know, half a liter of water just and through breathing. Legs and then pull Number 15. Or down on the bed, depending the what DNA helix is only 80 billionths so of an inch wide. Muscles. But if and you I put the molecules end to end, it would reach from the Earth to the Sun this. and back again 300 times. So that sounds painful though, so I wouldn't. <laughs> Number 16. All human beings share 99% oh, right, yeah. of their DNA so with each older. other. So you can quite validly say that you're 99% yeah, similar to Dwayne The Rock Johnson. The but no. you also share 98% no. of it with a chimpanzee and up to 50% yeah, well, of it with a cabbage. Teach, right? That's so, the point you know, of it's not this. We have to gain knowledge. That's why we're in class. Things. Not just to... Number 17. According to research, the three things that women dream about most in the first trimester of pregnancy are frogs, potted plants, and worms. So if you ever dream about Kermit's annex to a cactus playing on the PlayStation 1 game Worms, I have some news for you ladies. Number 18. The body contains 200 pay receptors per square centimeter of your skin, but it also contains 15 receptors for pressure, 6 for chilliness, and 1 for warmth. Number nine, a team. Newborn babies, those right? silly little well, fluffy fools, doesn't have see everything upside down to, as their little eyes haven't learned to flip the images up the right way yet. No wonder they the find everything terrifying and cry all the time. So we need a ready Number twenty. Little baby babbers don't actually release tears from their eyes until they're at least one month old. They've got nothing to cry about. They don't have bills to pay and. Jennifer Lawrence to ignore them. ATP only oh, lasts 15 God. seconds and it's all Number 21. Up. And then Babies are also born without kneecaps. They don't appear until the age of two. So it's, yes, it's a Belinda from Accounting's baby is adorable and everything, but would it win a knobbly knees contest? I ready to not. donate to ADP Number to 22. When you were born into so the world, you had over 300 bones in your body. But when you blossom into an adult, you only have 206 bones as they all fuse together. A bit like a transformer, it, except the not in a sh film. To give to ADP to make ATP and then creatine is just a waste product left Bones over. are 50 times lighter than steel, but so just we'll as strong. Time, so you are, kind of, a man slash woman of steel. Not just you anymore, eh, soups?